This is going to be talking about Newton's laws of motion and gravitation. And a little bit of an introduction to gravitation will stop because that's as far as we got in class at a certain point. Here's a picture of Isaac Newton years ago. I had a student who looked at the picture and said, he looks like Robert Plant. And if you don't know who Robert Plant is, he was the lead singer of Led Zeppelin. Still around as far as I know. He doesn't look like this quite anymore, but we can see what he looks like anyway. Oh, before we get to that, if you like reading about history, I think I've talked about these books before. I try to push them quite a bit. So these books, if you're a history buff or like reading about that sort of thing. Um, the books by Davis Sobel are pretty good. I haven't completely read the sleepwalkers except to just reference certain points. So um, that's something that someday I'll pick up and read through the whole thing. It's about the period of time with Tycho and Galileo and Kepler and I'm not sure how far it goes. But anyway, and then the two by Owen Gingrich, which I enjoyed very much. Anyway, here's the picture that compares Robert Plant on the right to Isaac Newton on the left. And uh, I guess they had similar hairstyles at one point. Okay, a little biographical outline of Newton. This would have been him as an older man. He was very well known in England, so he had a number of portraits of himself drawn, or people wanted them anyway. He was born in 16, actually, the year he was born, it was 1642. In fact, it was Christmas Day in 1642, which was the same year that Galileo died. But during his lifetime, at some point, uh, Great Britain, or maybe they called it England in those days, um, switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And when they did that, they had to just kind of wipe 11 days off the calendar. And so I don't know what time of year they did it, but it was as if starting on New Year's someday, or maybe you went from New Year's Eve all the way to January 12th or something like that. Uh, I don't know exactly when they did it, but they also kind of post-dated it. So uh, they revised certain dates in history to reflect that 11 day change as well. And that bumped Newton's birthday into 1643. But most of the time when I look up his birth date, it's Christmas day, 1642. He developed the laws of motion and gravitation. We'll learn about those here. We don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the laws of motion, but they are actually at work in everything we're doing in astronomy. So they're there. He also developed calculus. He co-invented calculus with a scientist on the continent of Europe, Leibniz, and uh, they squabbled over who invented it first throughout the rest of their lives. But uh, they weren't working together. They did it independently. I shouldn't say he co-invented it. He just independently developed it. A lot of his scientific work was done in his 20s. Uh, later in his life, he ended up being the keeper of the head of the British Mint. And it was during his time at that job that they started adding ridges onto coins. We have them on quarters and dimes. In England at that time, the coins were gold or silver. And people would take a knife and shave the gold or silver off of the coin and save their own little pile of gold or silver and keep using the coins. And the coins dwindled in time. And then people would either make their own coins out of gold or trade that weight in gold for an equal amount of money. So it was a way of getting return on whatever coins you had in your pocket. What we have so far are Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what a scientific law happens to be. I know I've had uh, people who think that the scientific method is to you start off seeing something that you don't understand. You develop a hypothesis about that something. You test your hypothesis with further observation. 
if it stands up to the observations or the test you put it to, then you might group a bunch of similar hypotheses into a theory. And then if the theory gets proven, it's a law. And turns out that's not correct at all. Um, the, the, or for one thing, we never prove scientific theories. We can disprove them, but there may always be some information out there waiting to be discovered that could disprove it. So every scientific theory is just, it's accepted, it's supported by observation, but everyone still has the idea that it may be proven wrong at some point, or we may go beyond it. Um, laws, however, are just descriptive generalizations about how nature behaves. And here's the definition that Wikipedia has. A scientific law is a statement based on repeated observa experimental observations that describes some aspects of the universe. The scientific law always applies under the same conditions and implies that there is a causal relationship involving its elements. Kepler's laws fit very well in this. Uh, when we talk about uh, Kepler's laws, the first law is planetary orbits are ellipses. Okay, that was based on Tycho's repeated experimental observations. And Tycho didn't do the mathematical analysis for it, Kepler did, but he discovered by applying mathematics and studying those observations very carefully that planetary orbits are ellipses. The second law, a line drawn from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. That's just describing what is going on. And then the third law, P squared equals CA cubed. So we have that. And in the case of Kepler's laws of planetary motion, they applied only to he thought planets orbiting the sun, but he only knew about planets orbiting the sun. Later, people found that they also applied to comets, they applied to asteroids, and all kinds of stuff that we found orbiting the sun since the time of Kepler. But uh, as far as the causal relationship, Kepler didn't have any why to his laws. He didn't know why that was happening, but Newton comes along and he filled in some of the holes there, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, Newton's first law of motion is one that uh, you've probably heard before. Most of Newton's laws are things that you may have studied, but may not. <clears throat> uh, for the most part, this one was developed by Galileo. In fact, Galileo had a statement that's very much like what we'll see for the statement of Newton's first law. And here's Newton's first law. An object will remain in a state of rest or uniform motion unless it is acted on by an unbalanced outside force. So I need to talk. Well, you know what a state of rest is. That would just be something sitting there, not moving. So no surprise with that. Uh, as far as the uniform motion and the unbalanced outside force, Uniform motion means moving in a straight line at constant speed. And the unbalanced outside force is something that comes from outside and isn't balanced by another force. If you have a coffee cup that's sitting on a tabletop, it has outside forces acting on it. One of them is gravity pulling down on it, Earth's gravity. Another is the force of the tabletop pushing up. And those forces are balanced, so the coffee cup just sits there. Um, let's see, the uniform motion, the way that Galileo experimented with this is that at the time of Galileo, the physics that most people accepted were the thoughts laid down by Aristotle thousands of years before. And Aristotle said that in order for an object to keep moving, there had to be a force acting on it. Well, Galileo was an experimenter and he would roll objects, mostly balls of some sort, maybe something like, I don't know, bocce balls or whatever that they play with in Italy. I don't know what he was actually rolling down there, but he would roll them and he found that if he rolled them on a rough surface, they would come to rest pretty quickly. If he rolled them on a smoother surface, they'd roll farther. And if he 
managed to roll them on a very smooth surface. And I could imagine him rolling them on the marble floors of the Medici Palace or something like that. They'd roll very far. And Galileo would do these experiments, make them as good as he could. And then you'd imagine what would happen if I could make that perfect. If I could make the floor perfectly smooth and the ball perfectly round, I think it would roll forever. And so that's where he started coming up with ideas about this uniform motion, an object remaining in a state of uniform motion unless it's acted on by an unbalanced outside force. He realized that the reason the rolling ball would stop was because it had friction between itself and the surface. And the rougher the surface was, the more friction there was. You have to trust this law in the wintertime. If your car is moving, it will keep moving unless there is an unbalanced outside force acting on it. Most of the year, we can depend on friction between the tires and the road to stop the car. But in the winter, that friction may be severely reduced. And if it is, your car will keep moving. And so you have to slow down very slowly in the winter time. Another form of acceleration is changing direction. And uniform motion means you're not changing direction. You may not make the curve you want to do if you're going too fast. So watch out for that stuff in the winter time. Uh, let's see, I'm not going to worry about this artificial gravity with Newton's first law because I can't do the demonstration here. Um, Newton's second law of motion. We wouldn't bother counting them if there was only one. Um, this one, most of the time you see it written not as A equals F over M, but instead as F equals MA. And so don't know where my little dot went. Hmm. I thought I had a pen. Okay. Most of the time you'll see Newton's second law written this way. F equals, this is hard to write with, with a mouse. Anyway, MA. <laughs> That's pretty bad. But uh, that's the way you see it most of the time, except that people look at that and think, okay, so you have a mass, that's what M stands for, and you give it an acceleration and that produces a force. And that's not the order. If you have a force that is applied to a mass, then that mass may accelerate. And so, in fact, if you have a net unbalanced force acting on a mass, you, it will accelerate. And this is the equation that describes it. Uh, the concept of mass. Mass is the property an, of an object that is a measure of how hard it is to accelerate that object. We measure mass in kilograms. And most of the world <laughs> uses a kilogram as a unit of weight. And turns out it's not. Um, stating it verbally, it's just the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. Something you can see because it's force divided by mass, the bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration will be. It's easier to push a little wagon with a five-year-old child in it than it is a full-size pickup with a 250-pound man and a load of firewood in it. So. That's what goes on. OK, we talked about what the letters stand for. It looks simple, but it can get very complicated. And that's all I'll say about it. Newton's third law of motion. This is one that if I started saying for every action, I know a lot of people would be able to say there's an equal and opposite reaction. Except what is an action and what is a reaction? Well. Here's a better way of thinking of Newton's third law of motion. When one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object will at the same time exert a force back on the first object. This reaction force will be equal in size but opposite in direction. All forces are interactions between objects 
and there are always two of them. One force acting on the second object, another force acting back on the first object. So we always have that. Okay, sometimes I do examples with this, but I want to jump right into Newton's law of gravitation here. And this was developed while he was in his 20s when Newton finished Cambridge University in his last year there. The university shut down for two years. They had a, an epidemic going on there. In this case, it was an epidemic of the bubonic plague and they closed the university for two years. I don't know why they didn't just teach all their classes online like we are, but they didn't anyway. This would have been in uh, about 1660 something or other. So he went home to his family's farm. It would have been his stepfather's farm, I guess in Woolsthorpe, England, and stayed there for the next two years. Kept thinking about mathematics and science while he was there. And this is when he did a lot of the gravitational law develop. We call it a law because it's a descriptive or a generalization about how things behave under certain circumstances. They behave as if there is an attractive force between things. And so that's why we call it a law. Same with the laws of motion as well. Uh, he didn't publicize it or publish it and nobody knew about it for 20 years. It came to light because of a question by Edmund Halley. This is Halley of Comet Halley fame. He's the one that Halley's Comet or Comet Halley is named after. He never saw that comet, uh, but what he did was read history and saw stories about this one comet that seemed to show up about every 76 years and people had never made that connection before. And he predicted when it would next appear. He died before the next appearance happened. But when it did show up on time as predicted, they named it after Halley. So Halley and another British scientist named Robert Hooke were trying to work out their own law of gravitation. They had no idea that Newton had done anything like this. And Halley went to Newton he was a brilliant mathematician, uh, but he didn't get along with Robert Hooke, so I guess they decided Halley would be the better person to go. And so he asked Newton, if you had a force that acted on something like a planet or something around the sun that varied inversely with the square of the distance, what would the orbits be? And Newton immediately answered, they would be ellipses. And Halley asked him, how could you possibly know? Newton said, well, I've proved it. It's, I've got it here in my notes somewhere. And eventually he found it in his notes, but his notes were in no shape to show anyone else. And so Halley found about this mountain of work that Newton had done in various topics and said, we've got to publish this. And Halley ended up paying for the publication himself. Both of them belong to something called the British Royal Society, which is their scientific organization. But the year that they got all the stuff ready to publish, the Royal Society had spent their whole publication budget on a book called A History of the Fishes, and they didn't have anything left to publish Newton's work. So Halley paid for it. The books were called the Principia. They were in Latin, and they are still in print. You can buy an English translation of them from Dover Books if you're interested in that. Long time for something to be still in print. I don't know that you can still buy copies of A History of the Fishes or not. He had to finish developing calculus before he could, uh, he thought it was ready for publication. And one of the things he showed is that the gravitational force of something like the planet, a planet like Earth, acts as if all of the mass of the planet is right at the very center of it. And he had to show that. And you can do it with calculus. It doesn't mean it's all concentrated there. It's just acting as if it is. OK, so Newton's law of gravitation. Here it is in words. Between any two objects with mass, there's an attractive force. 
this force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the centers of the objects. Okay, this may be a little bit intimidating. Proportional to the product of the masses means the masses get multiplied together. That's what a product is. And then inversely proportional, if it's an inverse proportion, that thing is going to go on the bottom of a fraction, and it's the square of the distance between the centers. It's going to get weaker with distance. So what this looks like in an equation is shorter. It's just this. F, that'll be the attractive force, is equal to capital G times M1 times M2 divided by R squared. Okay, M1 and M2 will be the masses of the two objects. R will be the distance between their centers. And capital G is something that we call the universal gravitational constant. And actually, I think the next slide just does what I just said. Well, maybe not. Anyway, it's between any two objects with mass. Planets, books on a tabletop, people. But it's very weak. Okay. Between two people, it's an extremely weak force. Um, you have to have one of the objects or the other, or both, be extremely massive for gravity to be an appreciably large force. The R in here stands for the distance between the centers of the objects, and it isn't necessarily a radius. Um, if you're talking about two people, they're not usually round but there would be a gravitational force between them. And the G is a proportionality constant. I'll try to write it here. It's um, 6 point, try to make a dot there, 6, 7, this is going to be messy. Anyway, times, this is in the metric system, by the way, 10 to the minus 11th, that makes it a small number. And the units of it, this is going to scare the heck out of you, but don't worry. I won't make you do many calculations with it. Newton meter squared, that's a squared up here, sort of, per kilogram squared. Uh, by the way, a Newton is the metric system unit of force. Like in the American system, the unit of force is a pound. In the metric system, it's a newton. A newton is a smaller unit than a pound. It takes 4.448 newtons to equal one pound. So there's a little bit about it. OK, now why these laws matter in astronomy. The laws of motion and gravitation are universal. They apply on Earth and in space. Up until the time of Newton, there was an assumption that one set of rules applied on Earth and a different set applied in the heavens or in space. Newton said, same rules everywhere. And they let us understand and predict the motion of all sorts of astronomical objects. They give a why to Kepler's laws. You can develop Kepler's laws from Newton's laws of motion much more simply than doing hundreds and hundreds of pages of calculations based on Tycho's data. Although, to be fair, uh, Newton used Kepler's laws of planetary motion, particularly the third law, to develop the law of gravitation. And that's when he knew that he had things correctly. And they put the heliocentric model on a firm footing. But there is no why as to gravity. Why do two objects exert forces on each other? Why does the Earth exert a force on the Moon and the Moon exert a force on the Earth? Newton said, I make no hypotheses about why this happens. It just is. So we've got laws, generalizations, mathematical in this case, about how nature behaves, and they work. And so now we know why planets, comets, and everything else move the way they do. We can work it out mathematically using Newton's laws. By the way, um, 
when we send spacecraft to the outer parts of the solar system or to the inner parts of the solar system, we have to do a lot of calculations. Most spacecraft on their way to say beyond Jupiter get gravitational assists from Jupiter on the way by and a lot of heavy calculations to be done. They're all done using Newton's laws of motion. And so they work just fine. There is a more advanced law of gravitation that developed by Einstein, but we don't need it for things like spacecraft moving about within the solar system. Now I want to show you something about Kepler's third law and Newton's version of it. You can take Newton's second law of motion, A equals F over M, and the law of gravitation, F in this case would equal the gravitational force and you combine those with a couple of other relations like oh the speed of an object traveling in a circle is 2 times pi times the radius of the circle divided by the period of orbit stuff like that and you get this result okay on the left side and on the right side you've got things familiar from Kepler's laws p squared and a cubed but instead of having a plain old C, you've got this stuff here. This 4 times pi squared, that's just a number. Together it's roughly 40. And then the gravitational constant, down here we've got the mass of the sun. Well, what do you know? That's why all the planets orbiting the sun have the same C constant in Kepler's third law, the P squared equals C A cubed, that it's the mass of the sun that determines the properties of the planetary orbits. Okay. Now, by the way, this is an approximation. What should be down here for a more complete version would be the mass of the sun plus the mass of the planet. However, the mass of the sun is a thousand times that of Jupiter. It's 318,000 times the mass of Earth. And so if you're looking at a planetary orbit and you ignore the mass of the planet in this equation, you're only going to be off by one part in a thousand, even if you're talking about Jupiter. And so it isn't going to make much of a, a difference. But for some calculations, you might actually want to worry about that. Okay, we can use this law to figure out the mass of the sun. A couple of algebra steps and you'll have this. The mass of the sun is everything in here is a constant. This g is the universal gravitational constant. We can determine that experimentally. 4 pi squared, that's just about 40 and it's a pure number. So what you do is you watch a planet that orbits the sun long enough to figure out its semi-major axis, long enough to know what its period is, plug all the numbers in, and you've got a good measurement of the mass of the sun. And then you can average what you get for all the different planets and get an even more precise result. But as modified by Newton, we're not limited to planets orbiting the sun anymore. We can also use it for something like planets orbiting another star or moons orbiting a planet and situations like that. And if I can get the software to work for you at home, we'll use this to in a lab to figure out the mass of Jupiter. I'm not positive I'll be able to do that or not because they only run the software only works on Windows computers, but we'll see if we can anyway. But the mass of any orbited thing, this is the orbited thing, is equal to same 4 pi squared over g, but then you study the a cubed for the things orbiting and the p squared for the things orbiting, and figure it all out that way. So that's as far as I want to go in this thing. We'll talk about weight. I think I talk about that in the, the subsequent lecture. So.